the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, a reading from the mystical city of God by Venerable Mary of Agreda. Chapter 16. The Three Kings of the Orient Come to Adore the Word Made Man in Bethlehem. The three Magi kings, who came to find the divine infant after his birth, were natives of Persia, Arabia, and Sabah, countries to the east of Palestine. Their coming was prophesied especially by David, and before him by Balaam, who, having been hired by Balak, king of the Moabites, to curse the Israelites, blessed them instead. Numbers 24.17 In this blessing, Balaam said that he would see the king Christ, although not at once, and that he would behold him, although not be present. For he did not see him with his own eyes, but through the Magi, his descendants many centuries after. He said also that a star would arise unto Jacob, which was Christ, who arose to reign forever in the house of Jacob. Luke 1.32 These three kings were well versed in the natural sciences and well read in the scriptures of the people of God, and on account of their learning they were called Magi. By their knowledge of scripture and by conferring with some of the Jews, they were imbued with a belief in the coming of the Messiah expected by that people. They were, moreover, upright men, truthful and very just in the government of their countries. Since their dominions were not so extended as those of our times, they governed them easily and personally administered justice as wise and prudent sovereigns. This is the true office of kings, and therefore the Holy Ghost says that he holds their hearts in his hands in order to direct them, like irrigated waters to the fulfillment of his holy will. Proverbs 21.1 They were also of noble and magnanimous disposition, free from avarice and covetousness, which so oppresses degrades and belittles the spirits of princes. Because these magi governed adjoining countries and lived not far from each other, they were mutual friends and shared with each other the virtues and the knowledge which they had acquired, consulting each other in the more important events of their reigns. In all things they communicated with each other as most faithful friends. I have already mentioned in the eleventh chapter that in the same night in which the Incarnate Word was born, they were informed of this birth by the ministry of the holy angels. It happened in the following manner. One of the guardian angels of our queen, of a higher order than that of the guardian angels of the three kings, was sent from the cave of the Nativity. By his superior faculties he enlightened the three guardian angels of the kings, informing them that at the same time of the will and command of the Lord, that each of them should manifest to his charge the mystery of the Incarnation and of the birth of Christ our Redeemer. Immediately and in the same hour, each of the three angels spoke in dreams to the wise man under his care. This is the usual course of angelic revelations when the Lord communicates with souls through the angels. This enlightenment of the kings concerning the mysteries of the Incarnation was very copious and clear. They were informed that the king of the Jews was born as true God and man, that he was the Messiah and Savior who was expected, that it was the one who was promised in the scriptures and prophecies, and that they themselves, the three kings, were singled out by the Lord to seek the star which Balaam had foretold. Each one of the three kings also was made aware that the same revelation was being made to the other two in the same way, and that it was not a favor or miracle which should remain unused, but that they were expected to cooperate with the divine light and execute what it pointed out. They were inspired and inflamed with a great love and with a desire to know the God-made man, to adore him as their creator and redeemer, and serve him with most perfect devotion. In all this they were greatly assisted by their distinguished moral virtues which they had acquired, for on account of them they were excellently disposed for the operation of the divine enlightenment. After receiving these heavenly revelations in their sleep, 
The three kings awoke at the same hour of the night, and prostrating themselves on the ground and humiliating themselves to the dust, they adored in spirit the immutable being of God. They exalted his infinite mercy and goodness for having sent the divine word to assume flesh of a virgin. Isaiah 7:14 in order to redeem the world and give eternal salvation to men. Then all three of them, governed by an impulse of the same spirit, resolved to depart without delay for Judea in search of the divine child in order to adore him. The three kings prepared gifts of gold, incense, and myrrh in equal quantities, being guided by the same mysterious impulse, and without having conferred with each other concerning their undertaking. The three of them arrived at the same resolve and the same plan of executing it. In order to set out immediately, they procured on the same day the necessary camels and provisions together with a number of servants for the journey. Without heeding the commotion caused among their people or considering that they were to travel in foreign regions or caring for any outward show of authority without ascertaining particulars of the place whither they were to go, or gathering information for identifying the child, they at once resolved, with fervent zeal and ardent love, to depart in order to seek the newborn king. At the same time the holy angel, who had brought the news from Bethlehem to the kings, formed of the material air a most resplendent star, although not so large as those of the firmament, for it was not to ascend higher than was necessary for the purpose of its formation. It took its course through the atmospheric regions in order to guide and direct the holy kings to the cave where the child awaited them. Its splendor was of a different kind from that of the sun and the other stars. With its most beautiful light, it illumined the night like a brilliant torch, and it mingled its own most active brilliancy with that of the sun by day. On coming out of their palaces, each one of the kings saw this new star, Matthew 2.2, 2, although each from a different standpoint, because it was only one star, and it was placed in such a distance and height that it could be seen by each one at the same time. As the three of them followed the guidance of this miraculous star, they soon met. Thereupon, it immediately approached them much more closely descending through many shifts of the aerial space and rejoicing them by shedding its refulgence over them at closer range. They began to confer among themselves about the revelation they had received and about their plans, finding that they were identical. They were more and more inflamed with devotion and with the pious desire of adoring the newborn God and broke out in praise and admiration at the inscrutable words and mysteries of the Almighty. The Magi pursued their journey under the guidance of the star without losing sight of it, until they arrived in Jerusalem, as well on this account as also because the city was the capital and metropolis of the Jews. They suspected that this was the birthplace of their legitimate and true king. They entered into the city and openly inquired after him, saying, Where is the king of the Jews who is born? For we have seen his star in the east, announcing to us his birth, and we have come to see him and adore him. Their inquiry came to the ears of Herod, who at that time unjustly reigned in Judea and lived in Jerusalem. The wicked king, panic-stricken at the thought that a more legitimate claimant to the throne should have been born, felt much disturbed and outraged by this report. With him the whole city was aroused, some of the people out of flattery to the king, others on account of the fear of disturbance. Immediately, as St. Matthew relates, Herod called together a meeting of the principal priests and scribes in order to ask them where Christ was to be born, according to the prophecies and the holy scriptures. They answered that, according to the words of one of the prophets, Micah, he was to be born in Bethlehem since it was written by him that thence the ruler of Israel was to arise. Thus informed of the birthplace of the new king of Israel, and insidiously plotting 
from that very moment to destroy him, Herod dismissed the priests. Then he secretly called the Magi in order to learn of them at what time they had seen the star as harbinger of his birth. They ingeniously informed him, and he sent them away to Bethlehem, saying to them in covert malice, Go and inquire after the infant, and when you have found him, announce it to me, in order that I too may go to recognize and adore him. The Magi departed, leaving the hypocritical king ill at ease and in great consternation at such indisputable signs of the coming of the legitimate king of Israel into the world. Although he could have eased his mind in regard to his sovereignty by the thought that a recently born infant could not be enthroned so very soon, yet human prosperity is so unstable and deceitful that it can be overthrown even by an infant or by the mere threat of far-off danger. Thus can even an imagined uncertainty destroy all the enjoyment and happiness so deceitfully offered to its possessors. On leaving Jerusalem, the Magi again found the star, which at their entrance they had lost from view. By its light they were conducted to Bethlehem and to the cave of the Nativity. Diminishing in size, it hovered over the head of the infant Jesus and bathed him in its light, whereupon the matter of which it had been composed dissolved and disappeared. Our great queen had already been prepared by the Lord for the coming of the kings, and when she understood that they were approaching the cave, she requested St. Joseph not to leave it, but to stay at her side. This he did although the sacred text does not mention it. Like many other things passed over in the Gospels, this was not necessary for establishing the truth of the mystery. Nevertheless, it is certain that St. Joseph was present when the kings adored the infant Jesus. The precaution of sending him away was not necessary, for the Magi had already been instructed that the mother of the newborn was a virgin, and that he was the true God and not a son of St. Joseph nor would God have permitted them to be led to the cave ignorant of such an important circumstance as his origin, allowing them to adore the child as the son of Joseph and of a mother not a virgin. They were fully instructed as to all these things, and they were deeply impressed by the sacramental character of all these exalted and complicated mysteries. The Heavenly Mother awaited the pious and devout kings, standing with the child in her arms. Amid the humble and poor surroundings of the cave, in incomparable modesty and beauty, she exhibited at the same time a majesty more than human, the light of heaven shining in her countenance. Still more visible was this light in the child, shedding through the cave effulgent splendor which made it like a heaven. The three kings of the east entered, and at the first sight of the son and mother, they were for a considerable space of time overwhelmed with wonder. They prostrated themselves upon the earth, and in this position they worshipped and adored the infant, acknowledging him as the true God and man, and as the Savior of the human race. By the divine power which the sight of him and his presence exerted in their souls, they were filled with new enlightenment. They perceived the multitude of angelic spirits, who, as servants and ministers of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, attended upon him in reverential fear. Arising, they congratulated there and our Queen as Mother of the Son of the Eternal Father, and they approached to reverence her on their knees. They sought her hand in order to kiss it, as they were accustomed to do, to their queens in their countries. But the prudent lady withdrew her hand, and offered instead that of the Redeemer of the world, saying, My spirit rejoices in the Lord, and my soul blesses and extols Him, because among all the nations He has called and selected you to look upon and behold that which many kings and prophets have in vain desired to see, namely, him who is the eternal word incarnate, 
let us extol and praise his name on account of the sacraments and mysteries wrought among his people. Let us kiss the earth which he sanctifies by his real presence. On the following day at dawn, they returned to the cave of the Nativity in order to offer to the heavenly king the special gifts which they had provided. Arriving, they prostrated themselves anew in profound humility, and opening their treasures, as Scripture relates, they offered him gold, incense, and myrrh. Matthew 2.11 They consulted the Heavenly Mother in regard to many mysteries and practices of faith, and concerning matters pertaining to their consciences, and to the government of their countries. For they wished to return well instructed and capable of directing themselves to holiness and perfection in their daily life. The great lady heard them with exceeding pleasure, and she conferred interiorly with the divine infant concerning all that they had asked, in order to answer and properly to instruct these sons of the new law. As a teacher and an instrument of divine wisdom, she answered all their questions, giving them such high precepts of sanctity that they could scarcely part from her on account of the sweetness and attraction of her words. However, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, reminding them of the necessity and of the will of the Lord that they should return to their country. No wonder that her words should so deeply affect these kings, for all her words were inspired by the Holy Spirit and full of infused science regarding all that they had inquired and many other matters. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. 